How's everybody doing? Good. Doing good? Good. I, uh, you know, like Jennifer mentioned, I worked for U.S. Bank. I started there as a teller originally, <coughs> uh, going to college, and felt like I could make a living in banking, and, you know, started doing other positions there. So I, be, I was a banker for a little while. I was a, a branch manager. I ran a district um, there at U.S. Bank, and then I went into commercial lending. Um, and so in the commercial world, we did we have you know two different types of lending. Basically, you have your conventional lending, usually reserved for businesses that are really well established, um, and then you have your SBA lending, which usually is more for startups and you know uh, different situations where maybe they have less cash to bring in and, and different things like that. So, um, so yeah. So let's just go right into it here. We'll talk a little bit about it today. Um, a little bit about you know starting a business and owning a business, some some factors about that, and, but primarily it'll be more about the business lending part of things. And so, um, when meeting with a lot of business owners, it's surprising to me that they don't know a lot about it. Um, they don't know a lot about you know what kind of money they have to put into the deal. They don't know about um, you know what the general rates and terms are and. You know, nobody ever really goes over it with them. They know, they know how, you know, if they own a business making chairs, they know how to make chairs really well. But unless they took some classes in college about it, they don't know the financial aspect of it all. So we're going to talk a lot about that as well. So, um, so owning a business, we'll just go right into the business plan here. So when you're starting a business or buying a business or even an established business, you have to have a plan, um, whether that's to bring revenue into your business or whether that's to get it started. So um, if you take anything from this class, and this isn't in the slides here, but I want you guys to all write this down. When we evaluate lending for business clients, um, there's, there's basically five areas that we look at, and they call it the five C's of credit. Does anyone know what that is? He said credit and collateral. So those, those are some of the things we look at. Um, in general terms, the things we look at, so if you guys want to just write these down real quick, because we'll use it later in the presentation here, here in the beginning. Uh, character is what we look at. Capacity. Capital. Collateral. And conditions. So again, yeah, character is the first one. Capacity. Capital collateral, and conditions. So uh, in looking at that, we're going to first ask just some <coughs> starter questions here with this. So we'll look at um, these different aspects. So first off, when you're looking to get a loan, you need to determine how much money do you need. So out of those five things that I just listed, where do you think that would fit in? What category would that fit into? Capital. Yeah, right, capital. How much money you might have on hand compared to how much money you need. That would be something we'd look at there. So, uh, and you need to consider all the different things about this. You know, sometimes we have someone come to us and say, I need to buy a building. Well, that's great, but, you know, what kind of things do you need? Do you need to put furniture in the building? You know? Um, or do you want just an empty shell of a building? So, it's good to think about what equipment you're going to need, what kind of furniture you'd need what kind of working capital you might need just for those unexpected expenses when you're purchasing a building. Um, you know, a lot of things like that play into it. So um, how about how will you use the money? Where would that go into if we were going to look at this? Yeah, that's right. Capacity could play into that. Conditions would be a big part of this. Um, and then you really just have to have a purpose for the money. We're always going to ask that. That's another misconception. People think, oh, I need a loan. And I just need it to get some stuff for my business. And we need to know real specific what you plan to use that money for so you don't get a loan for your business and then go on vacation to Mexico. You know? So we, we need to know that you're using that for <coughs> your business and what the purpose is for that. Um, how about how will the loan impact your financial position? Where would that fit in? Might be character. That, that could maybe fit into that. The biggest one on this would be uh, capacity, too. So can you afford that new debt? How does that impact your position? By having a new payment to buy a building, 
Are you going to be able to afford that and still have all your business expenses paid for as well? So that's a big place that that would fit into there. Um, what will you pledge as collateral? Obviously, that would be where? Collateral, right? Um, and then how will you repay the loan? Again, that goes into capacity. So when we define some of these things, and we'll move on to some more questions here in a minute, but when we define these, when you look at character, the things we're looking at in that, we look at credit score. Um, we're going to look at their honesty and integrity. So if they fill out an application and they lie on it, which happens sometimes, um, you know, we, we might look at that and go, well, is he telling us the truth about what he's using the money for? You know, we question the character of that individual. Um, and so, and I always think that's funny because, you know, people act like we're not going to check. <laughs> you know, like they'll say, yeah, I have an 800 credit score. And we're like, yeah, we're going to verify that, though. You know that. So if there's a bankruptcy on there, we're going to find it. You know, um, so, so that goes into character. Um, capacity, really what we look at in that is, is uh, whether they can afford it. So we call it a cash flow ratio. So when, uh, a simplified way to look at that, the ratio we look for is a 1.25 ratio. And the easy way to look at that is basically for every dollar you're spending in your business, you're bringing in a dollar twenty-five to offset those expenses. So that's an easy way to look at that. Um, you know, we have a nice, complicated spreadsheet and model for that, but really, at the end of the day, that's all it is. So, um, capital. When we talk about capital, how much money do you have on hand? Um, and really, with that, it's it's really about if your business is stressed, if you're having problems in your business, will you have money to back that up and still pay your payment with us? Um, and so that's what we look at with capital, is looking at that. So the, the more money you have on hand, usually the stronger the deal is for us to be, be able to do it. Um, collateral. Um, with collateral, we look at, at Mountain America anyway, we look really at fixed assets. So there's fixed assets in your business and there's current assets in your business. Do you guys know the difference between those? Anyone know the difference between those? Yeah, basically. Usually it's, it's shorter term type of, type of assets that you have. Anyone else? So fixed assets are going to be like your longer term assets, so buildings or equipment, things that you can, you can really get money out of as well. And, and it's not going to really change a whole lot. You know, if the building's worth 800000 it might appreciate a little bit. But we know that it's probably going to be worth 800000 if you default on your loan, we can probably take that building and pay off the loan. So um, the other one is current at assets, and that's your short-term deals. And things like that would be um, like accounts receivable. So that's, that's stuff that you've done the work for, but you don't quite have the money coming in yet. Um, so you put it on an accounts receivable and try to collect that money. Um, and so that, that would be an example of, of a current asset that we look at, or inventory would be another current asset. So you have stuff sitting around you haven't shipped out yet or sold yet. Um, that stuff we could use as collateral. So um, when it comes to SBA lending, usually they're looking more for fixed assets, like a building or equipment, um, just because they know they can get money out of those, those items. So um, the last one is conditions. So economic conditions are the biggest thing we look at with this. So depending on what industry it's in, it might be a little more high risk for us than other industries. So like a restaurant, there's a lot of restaurants. They have a higher fail rate, different things like that. So we look more at that. And if they're in a restaurant, we may want them to bring more cash in or do some other things to offset that risk. Or um, a big one right now is out in Roosevelt, there's the oil fields and different things like that. And, there's been a decline in oil production. And so because of that, a lot of those businesses are struggling. So those are some, some examples of conditions. Um, so as we move on, so uh, again, here's some other questions. When will you repay the loan? What would you put that under? Capacity, Capacity. yep, exactly. Uh, can you still repay the loan? Same thing, right, capacity. Um, can your business afford to lose money? This might go a little bit in capacity, but more so with capital. Again, if you have money on hand and your business loses money, then you might be able to inject some money into the business and save things with that. Um, how will your business manage risk? Again, when things get tough, 
Will you be able to inject money? Do you have a high enough ratio and capacity that you can absorb that happening with your business? Um, and then, uh, you know, is, is the business performing? Is it improving or declining? Sometimes when we do lending, especially if it's for a new business um, and someone's looking to buy that business, we'll look at the trends of the existing business. Are they going down? Are their revenues going down year after year? Or are they going up year after year? Is their income going up? You know, after all, they, they pay all their expenses after they bring in the, the revenues. And you look at their net income, is that trending downward or upward? And we can make an argument to why we should do that loan. If it's trending upward, you know, even if it wasn't in our ratios, we sometimes can make that argument, well, in a year or two, it's going to be here. So we should do this loan for them, you know? So moving on, uh, this talks a little bit about just licensing and permits for a small business. So if you're starting a new business, um, here's some of the things that you'll have to look at getting. So you have a basic business operation license you'd have to go get, um, a permit or doing business as, and getting an employee identification number. You know, anytime you're going to have a new business start, you have to have one of these. Something that's not here too is a, a tax ID number. You obviously need to get that as well um, so that you can file taxes. Anytime you bring income in and start a business, you have to file taxes on that business. Um, zoning and land use permit, you run into this, where if you're buying a building, making sure that the building you're buying is a you know, commercial building, it's zoned for a commercial area. Um, sometimes there's special use permits, you have to get land use permits. So if you own like a, um, you know, say you have a doggy daycare or something, you know, to have dogs in that area and have a, a large amount of those dogs, and maybe it's in an area that normally doesn't, you might have to go to the city and get a special use permit for that property. So that's what that's talking about there. Um, sales tax license, if you get some of that. Fire department permits, again, for buildings. If you're going to buy buildings, those are some of the things you need. Special state permits as well. So there's a lot of, this is just a lot of miscellaneous things that people don't even think about that they might need. They just say, hey, I'm going to buy a building. And they don't realize they need to go out and get some of these other things taken care of. Um, so what I wanted to talk mostly about today is the financing part of things, because that's what I specialize in here. So, um, so the first thing, when you're starting a business, you know, we went over these five C's of credit. I want you guys to all think of those things. If you go to start a business eventually, I want you to be thinking of those things from the beginning. Um, when it comes to commercial lending, sometimes certain institutions aren't very forgiving of things that happened way long ago in the past. So um, the prior institution I worked for, for instance, if you had a bankruptcy ever, um, sometimes you can't get business lending. So I had a client we worked with, tried to get him a loan. He had a bankruptcy from 20 years ago. Wasn't on his credit, but he disclosed that he had a bankruptcy, and uh, they wouldn't give him a loan, even though everything else was perfect. So, you know, when you start the business, you want to be thinking of those things right off. Do I, you know, am I portraying myself well? Do I have good character here? Is my credit good? You know, am I going to have excess cash? Am I, am I going to keep excess cash on hand when I start my business? You know. Um, do I want to make sure I don't overspend so that I don't have too much debt, so that I can buy the things I need for my business when I need them? Um, am I going to have collateral? You know, those different things, those are things to think of right at the beginning of the process and continue those things throughout your business. So um, the different products that, that we have in the SBA department, as I mentioned before, conventional lending, there's different things that they do with that. So we'll take each category, so lines of credit here. Um, conventionally, usually they do a line of credit and they'll secure that with their accounts receivable or their inventory, their current assets with a line of credit. Um, and they'll use that for short-term expenses. So um, to give an example of this, say you use your line of credit to buy up more inventory because you're expecting more sales. Um, and then you'll be able to pay that off when you get all that money back in in, say, three months. That's what you'd use the line of credit for. Sometimes business owners get themselves into trouble with that. They'll use a line of credit and go buy a piece of equipment. And that's more of a long-term purchase. And they shouldn't use a line of credit for that. So um, what will happen in that if the line of credit's not used properly 
is they'll close it out and they'll turn it into a term loan, like your car loan or things like that, and it'll turn it into an installment loan. Um, on the SBA side of things, we tend to secure it with, there is an amount we will go unsecured, so our regular business express line of credit, um, and then there's an amount we'll go secured with. So when we secure this, like I mentioned before, in SBA we take fixed assets, so we'll take a building or equipment. Um, sometimes we even take a personal residence as collateral, because it's real estate still, so we will take that sometimes for collateral as well for our loans and lines of credit. Um, at the credit union, we're max, we're kind of limited in the amount of money we can loan up to on lines of credit as well. We'll only go 100,000. And that's because it's done through the program through the SBA. Um, when you look at other banks or different things like that, they sometimes will have higher amounts they'll go to on a line of credit. They have million dollar lines of credit or um, you know, 500,000. And so they'll go a little bit higher, and that's because they have an apartment, they're bigger, they have an apartment, deal with that, and they do the conventional side of things. So, um, so yeah, so those are, the, those are the things with that. Moving on here, we're talking about the express line of credit still. It's good for working capital, helps you pay the short-term expenses, your payroll, your inventory. Um, you don't have to pay certain vendors right away. That's what it helps with. Um, our turnaround times on these are really quick. Usually it takes two or three days to you know, look at getting them approved. So that's, that's pretty quick in the SBA world. They take a little longer, being that they're government-backed loans. Um, they have what's called a standard operating procedure. We call it the SOP. It's a manual that's about this thick, and it's all, uh, it's all dictated by the legislator. So when we go through and do these loans, we have to make sure it complies with that. And so it takes a little while to process them. <laughs> um, so for commercial buildings or things like that, it can take two or three months to be able to go through the whole process with it. Um, how this works too, just to explain a little bit about SBA. So every loan that we do at Mountain America that's on the commercial end with this, it's backed by the government. So these lines of credit, they're backed 50% by the government. So what that means is if you were to default on that loan, um, the government would actually come in and say, okay, we'll cover 50% of that debt if they aren't gonna pay it off. So by having that guarantee, we're able to do a little more lending or a little more things that we normally wouldn't do for a business because they're willing to kind of help us with their programs to, to bail them out kind of thing. If, I don't know if that makes sense. So uh, the other programs besides the line of credit, there's a 7A and a 504, and we'll go over those in just a minute. But um, those programs are typically backed a, a lot bigger. The 7A program is a 75% guarantee from the government. And the 504 is kind of split up. So we'll explain that a little more. But uh, they, cover, they cover ours fully on the 504 because we only do 50% of the lending. So it gets a little complex, but we'll go over that in just a minute. So moving on here, 7A and 504 loans. So um, you see right here it says from 10,000 to millions. Um, the SBA has a $5 million cap on their loans. So we can do purchases for buildings or equipment up to $5 million. However, in, in recent years, there's, there's a new Go Green initiative to where if the client decides to put solar panels on their building or things like that, we have an unlimited amount of money we can do for them. So to give you an example of this, we just did a loan a while back for a hotel. Um, our loan for that was $10 million. And we were able to do that because they, they spent you know, $300,000, $400,000 putting solar panels on top of the hotel that they were building. So um, that's a way to kind of get around that. Um, again, the purpose of, of these types of loans is to purchase land, an existing building, build a new facility, um, remodel their current facility, sometimes get equipment. So that's what we're looking at. The major difference between these two programs that they offer is the amount of money that has to be injected. So um, with a 7A loan, typically the business owner has to give us 20% down on that type of loan. Whereas a 504 loan, they only have to do 10% down. The 7A program, we can do it all at Mountain America. It's one loan. The 504 loan is split into sections. So if the client comes in with 10%, 
they have what's called the certified development company. And that company takes some of the risk away with the 504 program. There, there's only two companies in Utah that do it. There's the Utah CDC and there's Mountain West CDC. So those two companies are authorized with the government to be able to do those types of loans in Utah. So they would take a portion of the loan, they would do say 40% of our project, and we would do 50%, and then the client would bring in 10% in cash. And that's how we structure that type of loan. And the advantage, like I said, is so they only have to come in with 10% rather than 20%. So they're able to save some of that cash going into the deal. So, um, so again, just this continues the list here. Purchase of large machini machinery and, and equipment. Um, the amortizations on these can be 15 to 25 years. Most of them we do 25 years. So the am amortization is the amount of time that you know, we're basing the payments on. So just like with your mortgage, it might be a 30-year mortgage. Um, in the commercial world, we typically do those for 25 years. But our terms, as far as the rate goes, are a shorter term. So we'll usually do those for a five-year term or a 10-year term. That's the standard in the industry. So um, after five years, we'll look at the rate and we may adjust the rate. We may look at your business and see if everything's going well still, you know, different things like that. We do that as an institution, again, to limit risk for us. If your business starts kind of going downhill, we want to be prepared for that. And it's not saying we would, after five years, we'd say, nope, you owe us a million dollars that it costs you for your building. We would just work through that with you. Um, and so that's why we kind of, they set the rates at those terms. Um, so this says here up to 70% financing on most properties. They do this as a general term. So when we were talking about injections, there's also what they call special use properties. That would be stuff like gas stations, restaurants, stuff where the building is specific to that type of industry. Um, when they have that situation, usually clients would have to bring in 5% more in a down payment. Um, the other thing is startups. If it's a startup, there's more risk. And so again, you'd have to bring in 5% for that. So there's certain situations, especially in the 7A program, say it's a gas station or a restaurant, sometimes we'll only finance up to 70% on that deal because it's a little more high risk. And the reason for that is, say they default on a gas station, we can only sell that building to somebody that owns a gas station. Really limits what we can do. So um, this starts talking about the special use and, and, and other properties as well. So primarily what we do our lending for are these two up here. So office buildings, industrial warehouse, we do a lot of lending for those because they're lower risk. Um, we have a different department at Mountain America that does what's called investment properties. So that would be your strip malls, your multi-family housing, like apartment complexes, different things like that. They have a little bit different criteria, and we try to do those more conventionally rather than SBA. Uh, SBA does not participate in investment properties. So any property that you would own that's, that's not you, you know, occupying that property I guess would be considered an investment property. Um, and then the special use property like I was just talking about, so storage units, convenience stores, restaurants, charter schools, car washes, things that's very specific to those industries. Um, yeah, so and we talked about there's a little bit more injection with that that they would have to come up with. Um, the biggest thing when we, when, we, when we look at, if you're, like I said, if you're starting a business or you're looking to buy a business, you want to be prepared with the information needed in order to get lending. So when I meet with clients, I can't remember how many times I go, I go to them and say, okay, you want to buy a building? And they're like, yeah, uh, we can, we, you can finance 100% of that, right? And I'm like, no. <laughs> and, then, and then we talk about, well, where's your business plan? You're starting this new business. What's your business plan? What kind of demographics are you in? Uh, how much, you know, what are your projections? How much income are you gonna bring in the first year, or the second year, or the third year? And they're like, oh, I have to have a business plan? So, <laughs> you know, like, most of them come to us with good ideas, like, hey, I wanna, I wanna start my own food truck. But they haven't gone through and done any research to what that takes. As well as, you wanna have experience in the industry as well, 
And people get caught up with that as well, where they say, I want to own a restaurant. And they're like, great. What have you done for your, your wage income, your regular work? Well, I've worked construction for 20 years. And it's like, OK, well, we don't feel like you know the restaurant industry, so that's risky to ask. So you need to make sure that you know, if you are looking to buy a business, you know, right now maybe you know, work in that industry. Get to know what it is. Um, there's a lot of examples of this, and you want to do that anyway, you know, so you know what that industry's like, so you don't get into it and then go, oh, this is not what I thought it was, and I don't want to do this. So these are some resources that you can have. You can go to MacU.com. There's a business lending section there, and there's some things. You can look at our products and kind of our criteria for all the different business lending. Uh, SBA.gov is a really good website. There's a lot of things on there. There's business plans that you can go in, like sample business plans that teach you how to write that. Um, it talks about how to put together projections. There's a, a really good, it's called a quick reference guide for, for SBA lending. There's, it's like just basically a chart. And it'll show you all the different loan programs that the SBA has and what's required as far as how much you need to put down um, and what to be prepared with. So those are good resources as well. You can also call this phone number here where you can talk to one of our uh, the, our operators here that can give you information and stuff on this as well. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's basically everything. Minimum credit score. So technically our minimum is about 6 to 620 is where we look at. However, if there's some credit issues on there, you know, like I had mentioned, bankruptcy. So Mountain America will work with people with bankruptcies. Um, but there has to be good reason for it. It can't just be like, I didn't feel like paying my bills. So I claim bankruptcy. It has to be like, you know, maybe, maybe it was a medical issue. Maybe you had a business partner that ran out on you prior and you had to, you know, claim bankruptcy to, to repair that or whatever it was. So it's very good to be very detailed on that as well. And that runs, we run into a lot of issues with that as well where, like I had mentioned, you say, how's your credit? Oh, well, it's really good. I have an 800. And then you pull their credit and there's bankruptcy. And then they don't want to give you much detail about the bankruptcy. And it's hard for us to overcome that because we need to know what happened. You know, so we're because we're taking a chance on you. You know, we don't want that risk. Yeah. When when uh, you guys repossess a building or something, mm -hmm. and uh, let's say the building's worth three hundred thousand, but your uh, the loan that you you put out was was for $100,000, uh -huh. right? So really, you only need to sell the building for $100,000 to make your money back. Uh -huh. What do you guys do there? Do you still try to sell it for the three hundred and then make even more? Or? Yeah, um, we will take the whole collateral, basically. And so um, if there's any excess money that's there, we basically, you know, there's when it's an SBA lending situation, we usually kind of put that into a big pool to offset other situations. And so if there is extra money there, that's something that that we would do. We, so when we do collateral, a lot of serious conversations that we have to have with business owners, first thing is with collateral, we'll place the lien for the whole amount on their, on their collateral. Um, some people think, um, you know, well, as I pay it down, you know, that's gonna, you can reset the lien or you can put a smaller lien on a certain property. We'll put the whole amount, even if the value's not there. So say we take multiple pieces of collateral. So we take a building and we take their residence and say the loan's for $300,000. We'll put a lien on their building for $300,000, and we'll put a lien on their residence for $300,000. So um, that's a misconception that business owners have. They think, well, if the building's worth 200000 can't you put 200000 here and 100000 on my residence? And we don't do that. We fully secure it. And we do that just to protect in those situations. So the other thing is they have what's called a guarantee. So there's personal guarantees and business guarantees. So what you do is when you sign for the loan, you're guaranteeing that all the business assets in your business are going to help offset if, if this loan goes bad. And then we also have what's called a personal guarantee you sign, which means that you're also personally liable for this loan. So what that means is say we default on the loan, we'll go and take the building, we'll take everything we can to satisfy that debt, if there's still money that's still owed to us, we'll come after you personally and say, what assets do you have personally? 
even if there's no lien on your personal residence, because you signed a personal guarantee, we can go after your personal residence at that point. So that's something to be aware of as well. I had a client the other day that said they, they worked with another bank, I won't name the bank, but um, they went and worked with another bank and they said, well, they're telling me I have to guarantee it, which just means I'm co-signing on the loan, I'm not on the hook for anything. And I had to correct them and be like, no, that's not true, you are on the hook for this. If you're signing as a guarantee or a guarantor, you are on the hook for this. We can, they can come after your house if you default on this. So that's something else to be aware of. By creating an LLC or, or creating even an incorporation or whatever it may be, it does protect you from something, especially while you're currently running your business. And so that's why we're able to, that's why we have to liquidate those assets first before we go to them personally is because they've created that entity to kind of protect themselves. But when signing a personal guarantee on the loan, and that's why we, we require that, it doesn't, that eliminates that protection, basically. So, because they're still on the hook for it. But again, we will liquidate the LLC first and then go to the personal assets. You have a question? Yeah. Um, There's got to be something in place, I would assume, that says you're obligated to get the highest amount or accept the highest offer. I don't know if you owe them something similar to like a trustee sale where you just say, he owes us 100000 and here's all this stuff and you guys bid on it and we'll take the highest bid. Or what are our, our biggest, there's actually, um, the biggest thing with us is, is being able to, to liquidate our loan. And so there's really not a whole lot of guidelines with that. Is the only guideline is that we have enough to liquidate our loan. And so that's why when we do these loans, we have the client come in with cash or other things. That's why we do it at 80. When we take collateral, we usually only take 80% of what the real value is. And we do that to kind of protect with that. So there's a little bit of cushion in there. And with the way the liens are filed, you know, we just are trying to liquidate whatever we can to get to that payoff of the loan. So there's really not a whole lot of provisions that are in place for that. So, as the bank can sell it for anything that you want, there's nothing that says you're required to post it, post a public notice for sale. Or oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, well, well, that's what I'm asking. I get, I get what you're saying. Yeah, we do have to go through some of those motions. We do have to po post it publicly. We will try to, like I said, we will try to liquidate it. As far as what we'll accept, as long as it satisfi satisfies our debt, then. We're fine with it. But we do have to go through different provisions where we do have to post it publicly on auction. Um, you know, there's a whole checklist of items, and I can't think of them off the top of my head right now. But there is a checklist we have to go through um, in how we post that and where we list it for sale, okay. if that's what you're asking for. It is. Yeah, as far as that's concerned, as far as posting it, it is, it is regulated. Um, I wish I could think of all of them off the top of my head, but there's a lot of different steps we have to take to do that before we can liquidate it, so. How do you figure out, um, I guess, the feasibility of businesses that are more like consultant driven, that offer services as opposed to products? How do you determine that and what would the process be? Okay, yeah, so um, service driven industries, um, it's basically just your sales, so your revenues from that. The nice thing about that, so when you talk about that, you talk about, we, get, we would get into like business cycles. So with a business that's not service driven, there's a whole big business cycle, right? So um, they have to pay money up front, they get the materials, they build some chairs or whatever it is, and then they go and try to market those and sell it. So there's a lot of lag time in between when they have to front the money and when they get paid back on it. With service industries, it's pretty much immediate. So, um, so they do the service, they get paid right away, typically. Um, some carry a little bit of ARs or things to bring it in, but we actually like service industries better because we can see that, and we can see the revenue is coming in more immediate. Um, so really, you know, it's just a matter of just 
analyzing their revenues and, and when it's collected to be able to, to do that. We, we would do that off of projections. So kind of the process with that. So um, when you put together projections, say for a service industry, it's good to get to know somebody that's in that industry that can help you with the numbers that have done that. Or there's a lot of re resources online that can do that as well. Um, and we have a system at Mountain America. So sometimes we get projections where they're saying, I'm starting this new business. I'm going to make a million dollars in the first year. And then <laughs> we look at it and go, well, with the industry you're in, I don't know if that's really true. You know, so we have a system, um, we call it RMA. And basically that, it goes through and we can, we can pull out that industry and look at comparable numbers of what they do in that industry and kind of bring those projections down. So we analyze the projections to see if they're in line. Um, but typically, you know, initially we, we rely on the projections that are provided to us and then we adjust a little based on industry and what's going on with that. So that's how we determine capacity for that. You know, I, I talked a little bit about a cash flow ratio with the business. And so, like I said, you know, basically a dollar you spend, dollar 25 comes back in. We figure that same ratio on a global basis, which would include your personal debts and your business debts and all your total income. And we figure it based on that. So a student loan, um, we, we don't, I know that there is sometimes a delay on when you can pay those back, as long as you're going to school and things like that. But we actually will debt service it as if you're making that payment right now. And so that's, that's how we factor that in. It goes into the global ratio. So not only do you have to hit that 1.25 ratio for the business, but you also need to hit that globally and personally. Because um, you run into that situation where the business might be doing really good, but then you have four houses and a couple boats, and that's draining all your cash flow. So, yep. How do you factor in uh, the like, benefits as far as when you're looking at the global ratio of uh, personal income uh, as far as like utility or uh, veterans benefits or that sort of, I know sometimes they don't count as taxes. Yeah, so we can, we can count that as wage income. So we'll go into the global ratio. We would ask for you know award letters or different things like that to verify that it is an ongoing thing. It's not just temporary for five years or whatever it may be. Um, that needs to usually cover the life of our loan to be able to count it. So if it was a temporary disability or something like that, we wouldn't count it typically because most of our, our loans, the term is longer than five years. So yeah, that's how we would, we would look at that. We also to give a little bit of weight to you know retirement funds or other things, even though um, you know in order to get that you have to have hardship or take that out if you're not retired. We look at that if there's a large balance in a 401k or an IRA, uh, we'll sometimes count that as you know what kind of capital they might have on hand. So. It's worth getting those IRAs, guys. <laughs> it really is, really. I can go into a whole different spiel on that, but especially 401ks. If your employers match a certain percentage, that's like free money. So, but, yeah. You know, it depends on credit, but what kind of rates can you do on those uh, lines of credit? Okay. Yeah, so our, our rates, um, they're typically set based on, based on your credit, as, as you had mentioned. But kind of a range on the high end of things, they're usually about 9.5, somewhere in there. Um, and the low end of things, they're somewhere around like 7% somewhere in there. So with our SBA lines of credit, because they are through the Express program, we, a lot of them, once we do, are for startups or other things like that. So that's why they're a little bit higher rate. 